because we will be opening with prayer as we usually do. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this evening for what you have given us and what you teach us in your word. Lord, help us as we apply your word practically and we look at what it means to be a part of a church, but also help us to remember that the most important thing is that it's your kingdom and everything else is in subjection to that. Help us together tonight in your name we pray, amen. All right. So last week we ended with the beginning of what, so where we are here on page 9, section 2, statement of faith, the historical connection to articles of religion, and it talked about, and we talked about the fact that uh, John Wesley commissioned or ordained Thomas Koch and uh, Francis Asbury, how could I not remember Francis Asbury, my goodness, in 1784, and that was how the Methodist church began in the United States as those two, two men came over and went straight to work. Um, but given with, with their ordination, um, there was a basic statement of doctrinal beliefs called the Articles of Religion. John Wesley gave them 24. When the church was organized, they added one, which talked about, um, it put it in the American context, if you will. So they had a total of 25, but those came from the 39 Articles of Religion, or, yeah, I guess you could call them the 39 Articles of Religion, or the 39 Articles of the Church of England. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that today because we talked about it last week. Um, the point is that this is a part of not just our Methodist heritage, but also our heritage that traces back all the way to the early church because these do and are rooted in the um, unchanging Word of God. So we're going to page 10. The first article that we have in our discipline is the Holy Trinity. And you'll see, if you look at the first line right there by number 7, okay, the Holy Trinity, we believe in the one triune God, self-existent, everlasting, both holy, and then it goes on to say in loving in nature. But what, what I'm trying to point out is you'll see there's numbers, little numbers up beside the words. Those numbers are references to Scripture that are found just below that, that um, paragraph. So let's, let's start like this. We believe in the one, and that one that's that's there like an exponent number, but that's not what it's called in English, but we'll go with it. Um, it's a reference number, I guess. It says, Deut Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And it's also cross-referencing 2 Samuel 7, 22, Isaiah 45, 21 through 22, John 17, 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. The point is, that this isn't just something that someone said this will sound good in our book, but it's scriptural. And I'm not going to necessarily read every one of those, but I wanted you to see that. Uh, and then triune, which actually is pretty important to understand um, that, that we believe in the Trinity, the one triune God. Now, this is just a test. You don't have to pan the crowd with the camera. But is there anybody here who's ever heard me preach on the Trinity? Okay, so, so Jim's going to hold my feet to the fire. All right, I have, I'll have to keep working at that. <laughs> um, okay, so why is it important? Because... It's a misunderstanding of this doctrine that has caused schisms within the church. And 
Uh, and also, it's a doctrine of great importance because it's, a, it's an illustration, if you will. It helps us understand the love of God. But we're going to move on. Triune, however, uh, for that scripture, they have Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And then there's a cross-reference cross um, passages that come after that. And I should say here also that you're seeing this one, and, and I'm looking at what's online, so you can um, look this up online. You can go on the Bible Methodist Church's um, Connection of Church, I think is what it's called. It's BibleMethodist.org. Go to the menu, choose About, and it will say Discipline on there. You can choose Discipline, and you can see what the discipline says word for word, and I'm saying that because if you want to look up every one of these scriptures, you are welcome to do that. All right, self-existent and everlasting, both holy and loving in nature, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. He's also the creator, the sustainer, and ruler of all things. God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each eternal in being, equal in power and glory, and identical in essence. And that's where people sometimes get tripped up. They miss that right there. Because it is the three in one. All right? That's what we believe. So that is um, an orthodox position for sure. There are those who don't believe in the Trinity, and they explain that in different, they take their position in different ways, uh, but they, that would be heresy. <laughs> All right, so moving on, then here is at to page 11. God the Father. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. He intentionally seeks to relate to all people as Father, thereby declaring, uh, thereby forever declaring His goodwill toward them. In love, He both seeks and receives sinners, adopting as His children all who repent of their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And you have to understand, I'm, the, I'm overcoming the temptation to stop and preach. The person and work of Jesus Christ, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal and only begotten Son of God, became man without ever ceasing to be God. Once again, very important words. He is the God-man. He's not God taken... I'm sorry, he's not... Oh, well, you could look at it either way. He's, it's not like um, God had an avatar... And he took over a man. Or it's not as though there was a man who is God, but he is the God-man. He became man. He became God with us. And yet, as these words say, without ever ceasing to be God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and lived a sinless life. And, and you'll see um, that all of these are cross-referenced to Scripture. He died on the cross to be the one sufficient sacrifice for sin and to reconcile all mankind to God. Then he rose bodily the third day from the grave. Bodily, though, okay, so um, there were her heresies in the early church that said that Jesus didn't rise like bodily from the grave because he wasn't actually in a body. He was something, some other kind of matter or... Um, and then there are those who say that Jesus didn't actually rise from the grave at all, but that it was a trick that the church and, and some of his followers conceived. But we believe, and with good reason, it's not just a, a cross your fingers, hope it works type of thing. 
um, that Jesus rose bodily the third day from the grave and ascended into heaven. Page 12, where he is enthroned. Jesus is enthroned at God's right hand as our intercessor. And that's a glorious truth as well. It, it, it's when you stop and think about what God did for us by giving of himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to come and, and die for no other reason than that we might be made justified before God. See, God, what we began with is that he is both, both merciful and holy, and his holiness demands justice. And he satisfied his holiness and his justice within himself by giving of himself in the form of a man to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. sin. And, and that's beautiful. But then Jesus died. and he, Actually, we should start with the fact that he lived, and he was our example. But then he died, and he rose again, thereby conquering the grave for us. He's still God. He ascended bodily into heaven. And God gave of himself. I, I, I don't even know how to describe this except that if, um, if there were a supreme ruler of the earth who was a man and could clone himself, if you will, so that he could sit beside himself and plead the cause of his people to himself by himself. That's what he's done. He's done. He, he gave of himself, and, he, and, G, and Jesus is that manifestation, the God-man. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and Scripture tells us that he is ever interceding for us. In John chapter 17, I believe I have that right, Jesus prayed for his disciples, and in that prayer, he included us. And that, those are such powerful words in Scripture. But that's not the end of this. Tonight, as I sit before you stumbling around with my words, and, and we are, we're just people. And, and billions have inhabited the earth. Billions of people. And yet each one of us bears the image of our Creator. And, and yet here we are trying to, in our short lifetime, do what God wants us to do. And that seek him and find him. He is so invested in that, in us finding him and seeking him, that he gave of himself that his his this his son Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father even now, looking down on us right now, praying for us. So I preach too long when my Green saver comes on. <laughs> the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is of one substance. Okay, so, so this is where it's oneness. Three in one is that God the Father and Jesus God the Son and now the Holy Spirit, that Holy communication, if you will, between the Father and the Son has personhood, and yet they're all of one substance, one majesty and glory. So, we believe the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and Son is of one substance, majesty and glory with the Father and Son, truly and eternally God. As the third person of the Trinity, he continually glorifies Jesus Christ, convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, regenerates all who repent and trust in Christ for salvation, sanctifies and indwells believers, and guides into all truth. He is ever-present, assuring, preserving, guiding, and empowering the believer for godly living and service. We're going to go to page 13. I do want to pause for just a moment and ask, is there any... Questions? Okay. And we'll just keep going. 
the Holy Scriptures. By the way, I did, I did look at the 25 articles, original articles of the Methodist Church, and the 39 articles of, of the Anglican Church. And, and it's pretty neat to see that, that these are just the things that the church has passed down for two centuries now. I mean, two millennia. Wow, not two centuries. Um, for 2,000 years, it's the same thing, the Holy Scriptures. This, this is going to talk about what we have studied here. We believe that the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments constitute the Holy Scriptures and are the written Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and therefore inerrant in the original writings, and have been transmitted to the present without corruption of any essential doctrine. They contain all that is necessary for our salvation, and are the supreme authority for faith and practice. The Old Testament is not contrary to the New. For both in the Old and, I'm sorry, for both in the Old and New Testaments, everlasting life is offered to mankind by grace through faith in Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man. The Holy Scriptures have been given for our comfort in order that we may have hope, and for our correction and instruction in order that we may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Any questions? If you want to stop and look at some of that scripture, you can stop me too, okay? Um, but Jim's smiling like, of course that's what that scripture is. There. Number 14, page 14, sorry. Sin, original sin and acts of sin. It seems to me there should be like a sin, some sort of a dash there or something. Because, right? Sin, original sin. Go for it. No. And acts of sin. So, so it's talking about sin, and then there's two parts to sin, right? Uh, it's original sin and acts of sin. And this actually, once again, it's the same language that's found clear back to the Anglican church. Um, we believe that sin and death coming, come into the world through the disobedience of Adam. We believe that sin is of two kinds, and this is it, original and actual Okay, so what's the difference? Original sin, we believe that original sin or inherited depravity is the corruption of the nature of all the offspring of Adam. Therefore, by nature, we are fallen from original righteousness, hostile to God and his law, and utterly unable to redeem our lost condition apart from grace. We further believe that though its control over the believer is broken, Inherited depravity continues to exist in the nature of the regenerate until the heart is fully cleansed by the filling with the Holy Spirit and entire sanctification. Um, so I, I'm thinking real quickly here, if, if I were to compare... Because I want to mention this. Sorry. I, what, what I'm trying to see is in, some, in the older, so talking about of, of original or birth sin, this is the, the Methodists. Um, this is from the AME, but it would match with what would have been the original American Methodism. They say, original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, as the Pelagians do vainly talk. And that is also from the Articles of Religion from the Anglican Church. We don't, they don't talk about Pelagianism here, but the reason that this is worded the way it is is that there was a heresy, Pelagianism, where uh, those who the Pelagians believed that we had a choice uh, from the beginning, and we became 
this, this inward sin was because we followed the way Adam had lived. But we could choose not to follow the way that Adam lived and we would be perfect before God. That's a heresy. Now, astonishingly enough, um, there are those who still believe that in spite of what the church has taught over thousands of years. Um, but this is, this is our stand in the Bible Methodist discipline, Bible Methodist church, and it is, um, it is the orthodox belief. Okay? That original sin or inherited depravity is the corruption of the nature of all the offspring of Adam. Therefore, by nature we are fallen from original righteousness, hostile to God in his law, and utterly unable to re remedy our lost condition apart from grace. We further believe that though it, its control over the believer is broken, inherited depravity continues to exist in the nature of the regenerate. regenerate it, it, regeneration is when we get saved. So the saved person has this nature within until the heart is fully cleansed by the filling with the Holy Spirit and entire sanctification. That's what we believe. And I can tell you um, that's kind of the thing that begins to set us apart from a lot of other churches. Because we're saying that there is a point of entire sanctification where you are completely sold out to God, you are filled with the Spirit, and your inner being is cleansed of this nature. The danger, and I'm just going to be honest, this is not in here, this is me speaking. The danger that's found in this doctrine is that people come to associate it with a great amount of emotionalism. But it's not necessarily tied to great emotion. It's tied to faith. And our hearts are sanctified and cleansed by faith. The work that God does within us when we throw ourselves entirely upon him, and trust him to do what he said he would do. So that's, that's original sin, right? We're still in the sin category, um, but we're going to, the, to page 15, to acts of sin. We believe that acts of sin are committed by morally responsible persons choosing to do what they know is wrong. I'm going to actually read some of the scriptures that, that they use here um, because sin can be misunderstood, acts of sin. We believe that acts of sin are committed by morally responsible persons choosing to do what they know is wrong. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Okay? And then, or choosing not to do what they know is required, James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Alright? These acts of sin are therefore not to be confused with shortcomings, infirmities, faults, mistakes, failures, or other such deviations from a standard of perfect conduct, which are the re residual effects of the fall, and, and verse uh, 26 of Romans chapter 8, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This, this language um, that contains shortcomings, infirmities, faults, mistakes, failures, is often found in... John Wesley's writings, because it was something that with which they struggled in their societies, because they were reviving the scriptural view of sanctification. And as they studied that from God's Word, 
they saw that God was raising a standard of perfection. And then they came back together and said, yes, there's a standard of perfection. However, being absolutely perfect is not realistic. So what is that standard of perfection that God does require? And it is a perfection within the heart of being perfect in our hearts completely through and through with God. Um, and, and so then when they, they talked about it, they said, but we're still human. And that's where these shortcomings, infirmities, faults, mistakes, failures, um, come from, and, and the idea that they're residual effects of the fall. All right. This is where another place that we stand apart um, from, I, I don't know how, how you would divide it up, but free will. We believe God created humanity in his image with the ability to choose between right and wrong. And I'll go ahead and cite these verses. I'm not, I'm going to go on though. As a result of Adam's fall and the consequent corruption of human nature, which is what we just discussed. Uh, mankind is unable to choose right apart from God's grace. Okay, So we believe that man has the free will and the ability to choose between right and wrong. People, And, and this, this is an Armenian doctrine. Armenian, not meaning from Armenia, but from, from the man... Arminius, who stood in opposition to John Calvin, saying, we don't have any ability to choose between right and wrong. It's already predetermined for us, and we're predetermined or predestinated to be either lost or saved from, from the beginning of the world. Now, there is a revival of a lot of that doctrine, and, and there's a reason for it. Um, it's because... The, the church, the direction of the, Mer of the American church as a whole has been to actually mix the two and say, we do have the right to choose, but then after we've chosen, God, they, they, they retained that doctrine of uh, prevailing grace so that I'm saved and now there is no consequence to my actions. Right or wrong, sin or not sin. And what that made was a very soft church that's ineffective in the world. And people have begun to react to the lethargy and the sinfulness that's found within much of the mainstream churches, not just in our country, but worldwide, really, um, more or less. And so there are those who are embracing the, the old doctrines, which include Calvinism, but we still stand where we've stood with Methodism for hundreds of years, and, and that is that mankind was purposely made by God with the ability to choose right or wrong. The accusation then that is leveled at Arminians from Calvinists is that that takes away from um, God's ability to be in charge, his sovereignty. But God can, in his own sovereign will, place within the hands of his creatures, for his purposes, the ability to choose right and wrong. And I believe that's what he did. And that's what we're teaching here. However, and I, I, wanna, I went through all that to say this, um, the statement that we read here is mankind is unable to choose right apart from God's grace. Do you see it up there? And that's something I'm afraid that um, a lot of Armenians have not fully understood. Is that we don't, we don't tell God, okay, I'm ready to come to you. I'm in charge of this whole thing. 
But, and, and I can read on where it says, but through Jesus Christ, the provenient grace of God makes possible what, what human effort cannot do. We're, we don't have the ability in ourselves to bring ourselves to God and demand that He justify us. That word provenient, provenient grace, means grace that goes before. It's the grace of God at work in our lives before we are saved, before we are regenerated, that offers to us salvation. And it's only as He offers it that we can accept it. It's not up to us. But He offers it, and in His offering, we have the ability to accept. Therefore, individuals who reach and retain moral awareness are responsible for their choices and action. Prevenient grace is bestowed freely, and we're going to the next page, upon all mankind, enabling all who will to be saved. Not because they will it necessarily, but because they will to avail themselves of what God has offered to them in His grace and in His mercy. Only as a result of the enabling grace of God working in us are we able to perform works that are pleasing and acceptable to God. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I, I know that I'm not going to get through all of this and I just want to find a, a good place to pause and I don't want to bore you out for you. Horrible. I don't want to keep you forever. How's that? Salvation. We believe that salvation is the gift of God brought to man by grace and freely received through faith and not by our own works. God graciously justifies. That, that means that it's through what he did that we are we we're condemned to hell. We're condemned to eternal death. And under that condemnation we have no hope. It's God who says that condemnation is erased. That's when he justifies. He makes us just before him. And that's why it was necessary that the blood of Jesus be spilled. For it was through his blood that we can be justified by a holy God. <clears throat> Regenerates, that, that means that we're made alive and made new. All who repent of their sins, repentance is turning from, and believe on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he seals them as his own with the Holy Spirit. As the children of God, adoption isn't, isn't mentioned there separately, but that's how we become children of God because in this work of salvation we're adopted of God into his family. They're restored to fellowship with him. There's restoration. Delivered from the penalty of sin. That's going to the next page. As well as from willful practice. 1 John 3, nine. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin... For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Um, so that's as well as from its willful practice. That, that's not the end of that. There, we're going to get to a point where it talks about sinning after salvation. That will we'll more fully explain what it means for a Christian to abstain from the willful practice of sin. Um, are initially sanctified? Oh my. Um, can't preach that. But salvation is initial sanctification and given assurance of salvation by the Holy Spirit who dwells in them. Entire sanctification. We believe that entire sanctification, that's what I mentioned a little bit ago. Um, that work of the Holy Spirit by which the child of God is cleansed from inherited depravity and empowered for more effective service through faith in Jesus Christ. It is subsequent to regeneration, so it comes after we're saved and is accomplished in a moment, moment of time. And we're talking about entire sanctification, okay? Um, 
is accomplished in a moment of time when the believer presents himself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and, and we understand that that's from uh, the book of Romans. Thank you. Romans 12, 1. The Spirit-filled believer is thus enabled to live God with an un... Live... To love God, thank you, with an undivided heart. And then... We're going to the next page. This is another point still under entire sanctification. Okay, We believe entire sanctification is both preceded and followed by growth in grace expressed in advancing Christ-likeness. After entire sanctification, we grow in grace by responding to the Holy Spirit as He guides us to apply the principles of holiness in all areas of life. I could stop on just about every one of these points in the last two or three sections and preach for an hour at least. <laughs> Here's the trouble. You don't want to listen to me for hours, and we don't have hours to sit here. That's why you can access this and look up those scriptures that are um, referenced in here and study it out for yourself, and I hope that you do. Because understanding this is so important. Let's get to sin after salvation we believe that after we have experienced salvation, it is possible to commit sin and depart from saving faith. For in this life there is no such height of holiness from which it is impossible to fall. This too is, is the kind of language that you find in John Wesley's writings. Okay, now, now, this is what I was trying to talk about a minute ago. But by the grace of God, one who has fallen into sin may by repentance and faith find forgiveness and restoration which is 1 John 2, 1, is the reference for that, my little children. These things write unto you that you sin not, and if any, of you, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You, and the verse that I referenced was, a little bit ago was from 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, um, or he cannot sin because he is born of God. So it's the same writer who said, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And this is going, that we're going to pause, we're going to pick this up next week um, after that. But I, I just want to say this. If you read 1 John, you'll see that it's God's standard and God's expectation that we as Christians do not sin. We don't live that way. But the beauty of, of 1 John is in the middle of all of that, he says, but if we do, actually Jesus Christ is still sitting at the right hand of the Father advocating for you. So a person can be regenerated, saved, and trying to serve God and walking with God and Something happens. We're even, and we talk about humanity and our weakness in humanity. And Satan is out to to make us ineffective as Christians, and he will use our weakness and trip us up so that we even fall into sin again. Okay, whatever that may be. Uh, I remember the story that I read, and I can't even tell you where. It's, it was just set in, um, in a small town, probably in the Midwest, somewhere in the West, and, and, you know, probably 1930s, 1940s, somewhere in there. And the man, there was a man, and he was the town drunk, basically. And he was married and had a family and was completely useless as a person. And then... God got a hold of him, and God saved him. But he slipped, and somewhere along the line, he went out and he got drunk again. And, and the pastor was heartbroken. But his wife said, but there's a difference. He's, after he sobered up, he wept and cried. She said he was never sorry for it before. And so he was able to weep and, and cry and find his way back to God and pick up where he left off. And that's the key 
to understanding this is that God doesn't want us, sin's destructive. It tears up your life. God doesn't want us to stay there. And yet at the same time, His mercy doesn't end when we've chosen to avail ourselves of His grace and be regenerated. And, and He knows, as the psalmist said, He knows our frame. He knows how we're made. And He will forgive and forgive and forgive. And if we'll trust Him and continue to throw ourselves on Him, He will help us to live that life that's above sin so that we don't have to live with the damage and the destruction that sin brings. We can overcome it. And and 1 John is is kind of a little book where you can read all about that. It's it's really amazing. I and I read I did something interesting. Um I don't know what if if you guys have a, a Bible app, but I use Bible Gateway. Um, and it has, if I look up a passage, let's see if I can find it. If I look up a passage, there's a little button. Um, that allows me, right here, if I touch it, it brings up another version right next to it. So I can read, and then my default is King James, but I can read, this is English Standard, ESV, side by side. I can read them side by side. And I, I heard somebody say that the English... Standard version was written by somebody who was um, who didn't believe like we do that you could live above sin. What I should say translated, and so they were they were working in First John chapter three, and they had to work through the language of what the apostle wrote, and um, that that. They said something like, but we don't believe that you can live above sin, so that's not what this passage must have said. So we have to somehow couch it in terms of what we believe and know God to be saying. And yet still, if you read them side by side, that's what I did. I read them side by side. It still is the same message, that God doesn't want us to live in sin. He has the power to keep us above sin. And if we fall, he will lift us back up. All right. Got an amen while I'm talking about the discipline. <laughs> so before we go, we're going to pray together. Um, and, and I know we mentioned some things this morning. Uh, Jordan and Heidi Sankey were at, are at, probably still in service right now, at uh, Grants, New Mexico. Let's pray that uh, God's will be done as they seek a pastor and as Jordan and Heidi seek God's will. Pray for them, and then I'll be traveling down in the last part of this week to go to Grants to meet with uh, some of the people that are part of the um, function of, of working, to not, not just as establish a church but the building that's there to take care of that too so i pray for me as i travel pray for our work and then um i i would say too that we we need to continue to pray for brother sam's um he did have a heart attack a few months ago and he's he's working hard and we just need to hold him up in prayer and make sure that we pray for him, for his health and strength, and probably his wife would say good common sense <laughs> uh, to know when to not, when to stop. So let's pray for Brother Sam's. Um, let's pray for what Hector and I had a conversation yesterday. Um, probably 
what's going to happen in the next few weeks, maybe months, is there's going to begin to be a Spanish service here again in the afternoon. Um, we saw that there's a pretty good start for that this morning. And uh, so let's pray for that. There's a lot of things that we discussed yesterday, and, and we want to do it right. So pray for that. Um, and then we want to pray for Marcy and Edith and um, those who might be sick. I know that Cindy had said she was out of town. There are those who have been coming and going in the last few months, and sometimes we they contact us, sometimes they don't. I think that Pastor Eric's been in touch with Sam, the single guy, uh, and he, you said he got a job where he's working nights or something like that, but let's pray for him. He really was sinking. Um, oh, you're going to meet with him this week? You're supposed to meet with him. Anyhow, any any requests you would like to mention? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Pray for Ben. I know that he he start he's starting a new job or new job or back to an old job type thing. And I th- imagine that's pretty exciting for him because of, I think that's what he wanted to do. So let's pray for Ben. All right. Anyone else? All right. All right. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Our Father, we come to you once again. We thank you that your word is clear and we can learn from it. And we pray that you'll once again help us to keep things in the right order um, and, and keep you first. And what we do as men to try to organize your work, keep its rightful place. Lord, we pray that you will help us as a church, the things that we're doing um, help us not to be cheerleading for a denomination or or this church or that but for your kingdom and yet at the same time we understand that it's through organized works that your work is best done because we find strength as we work together we pray that specifically you will help us in our revival that's coming up in a couple of months and then be with those who are part of the ladies retreat We pray that you'll just help that to be profitable in your kingdom and uh, give us strength as we do those things. We pray for those who are sick. We want to remember to pray for Marcy and Edith and hold them up in prayer. And we pray that you'll be close to them and that your will be done in their lives. But Lord, it's, it's one thing when we're able to come and meet together. It's quite another when we reach a point in our lives that we can't do that. We understand that in that position they need a special touch from you for strength and help to keep encouraged in you and their faith strong. Lord, we want to pray for Garrett, even though John isn't here this evening. Pray for his friend. We want to pray for uh, those who were mentioned Wednesday night. Pray for the family of Evan uh, that you'll work and comfort that family. Lord, we pray that um, you'll be with those of us who are traveling this week, be with us as we work there in grants to establish a plan. Help us to be careful as we are stewards of what you have given. Help us to be careful to invest properly and well in your work so that there's a return. Lord, we um, pray for Ben this evening. We pray that you'll be close to him, work in his life, and continue to draw him to yourself. Be with Sam. <clears throat> be with Pastor Eric as he meets with him. May, may it be a time that's profitable. We pray for Samuel and Faith. You know about them and where they are. We pray that you'll bring them back to our fellowship according to your plan. Lord, we pray that... Um, be with those within our community of believers who might be facing some things that 
We don't know. We just want to hold each other up in prayer and may we love one another and do what you would have us to do, live the way that you want us to live. Lord, we pray that um, you'll be with Jordan and Heidi Sankey as they're in grants today. We pray that you'll help in the process of making a decision of who the pastoral leadership would be in that new church there. And Lord, we want your will to be done. We want people who are going to be in the center of your will because that's how your work moves forward. We just want to be the part of it that you would have us to be and help us to examine our lives and know that we're right with you, but not just stop there, but move forward in maturity and um, help us to understand your calling for our lives and work in us the way that you would and uh, that we would just follow and listen and grow in you. Lord, we thank you once again for the time we've had together tonight. We pray that you will be with us <clears throat> throughout this week, be with Hector and, and the people that he brought to church this morning. Lord, you know about those plans moving ahead. We're not sure how all that should work, but we want it to be done well and in good order, and we want your will to be done. And ultimately, we want to see people saved and walking in, in your light and sanctified and know that they're right with you and doing your will. And we pray that you'll be careful, that you'll guide us and that we'll be careful to look for your guidance and to follow it. Lord, we pray that you'll go with us as we leave this place, bring us together again according to your will. It's in your name we pray.